long time, so now they let me do whatever I want. Um, so this talk, uh, Skydog asked me if I'd speak a while ago, and I said, sure. And I wasn't sure what to talk on, and I was debating. At one point, I was talking about uh, Python byte code, so that would be cool. But I didn't finish that one. And then I thought about talking, talking about hacking WhatsApp, because you can monitor it. They just send the password over. Put the clown mic in your face. This, this yeah, I don't know. Hello. Hello. Is that better? No, um, but I didn't finish that up either. And then I was sitting there working on a tobacco case, and I just got livid. And I was like, I know what I can talk about. And uh, Smoking. Smoking. Uh, well, I did consider, maybe, I was thinking maybe at Sky.com I'm doing a talk on uh, nicotine addiction, like how, how it works. It's pretty interesting, the science behind it's actually, from a hacking standpoint, is entertaining on how the cigarettes are designed to work. But um, I was working on a case, and I was sitting there, and I was like, man, these cases take fucking forever. <laughs> and then I realized, like, I get emails about every three weeks from people at these conferences, or just friends randomly, or like, hey, can you tell me what's happening in this case, or I'm getting divorced, or I'm getting something, and I was like, oh. And the first thing you always have to do when you're an attorney and someone emails you, especially from the computer world, is explain how the system works. And that's the longest drawn out part. Like, that's the hardest part, because everybody's like, I want to get divorced, and it's not done yet. It's been three years. And I'm like, well, that's how it works. But nobody gets why. So it's usually the first talk I give. So I figured at some point I should just give it to everybody at once. So they can start off the emails with, so I understand this will take fucking forever, but, and then you can get the question. Uh, actually, Adrian emailed me, what, two weeks ago? Yeah. Are you getting divorced? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> there was a problem with stalking. So apparently. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, so we're going to go over litigation in the U.S. And, and you guys all, who watch the news? Any, anybody? Who tries to avoid it? I do. Yeah, I hate it. But uh, if you do catch anything, it's always silly little news alerts, right? And it's always, oh, so-and-so got 50 bajillion dollars for something stupid, or this litigation's gone on for so many years, or something silly, right? And they never actually go into enough detail so you know what's happening. Uh, so we're going to try to cover that so when you see something, you'll understand what's going on. We're going to start off with a real quick thing, and I've done it before at these talks, just on jurisdiction and how it works in the U.S. Does anyone actually know how the jurisdiction of the United States of America works, like, between each state and between the federal government and the state's government? Assume we're retarded. Okay. So everybody's retarded. This is yeah. <laughs> Do you want no. me to say it out loud, or are you going to do it this time? <laughs> no, Damon, say you're retarded, Scott. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm retarded. Oh, you're, you're going to do that. <laughs> Steve Boy wins that round. <laughs> Are you about to do the, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your Oh, you want me to, you can do it. No, no, I, uh, uh, no, you do it better than I'm that. an attorney, I'm not your attorney, keep that in mind. I already told you, he's I in Georgia. Yeah. I'm barred in Florida, not in Georgia, so if you live here, <laughs> God help you. <laughs> so, uh, no, um, so the way jurisdictions work, and it's actually on that point, is each state has their own set of laws, and each state handles their own business, roughly, minus what's taken up by the federal government, which is defined roughly by the U.S. Constitution at this point and then whatever Supreme Court says it is. Um, so Florida holds Florida law, Georgia has Georgia law. Florida Supreme Court is the end-all be-all of Florida law. The U.S. Supreme Court cannot come in and change a Florida law issue. It's not their jurisdiction, they have to keep out of it. If it's a Florida-only issue, say bond validations within Florida, the U.S. Supreme Court can do nothing unless it violates a U.S. constitutional mandate. And then they can say, oh, you violated due process, now we get to jump in. Other than that, Florida's in, it's, its own sovereign area. Georgia, same thing. Georgia's its own sovereign area. So the rules are always different. So every state is completely different. So I get emails from friends from high school that were in Missouri, and they were in a contract fight. And I said, well, these are the things you can do. These are the general concepts to fight your own contract case. However, I don't know what your procedural rules are there. I don't know your administrative rules. I don't know what your evidentiary rules are. They're going to be completely different. And that state is sovereign over those rules. So always keep that in mind, but when you hear something on the news, they don't cover that a lot, but a lot of the news blurbs you'll see are federal law. And federal law is actually one of the more strict areas of law in the United States. Federal courts are a lot harsher than state courts in general. That's the general rule. If you get dragged into federal court, they're going to be harsher. It just uh, rules are very strictly enforced, but it's actually it can be a good thing for you depending on which side you're on and depending on what the case is. Um, anyway, so how did the U.S. legal system gets to where it is, and part of this is just mind games. So if you guys, if you've seen me talk before, you're welcome to just ask questions, blurt out, whatever. But essentially, the, what I wanted to discuss or what I wanted to bounce off of you was, how did the U.S. system get to where it's basically just a giant quagmire? That's my hypothesis. Is the U.S. legal system functioning? And I've been doing this for years now, and personally, kind of, it's the honest truth. And 
And the way I look at it is historically, if you look at classic litigation, in that sense I mean way back when, um, what's the classic example of family law in a classic context? Uh, blue laws? No. <laughs> Anybody know what blue laws are? Sorry, that's family. Can't drink on. Yeah, that's, that's like morality laws. But, um, so, did anybody have to go to Bible school ever? Did anybody ever hear that, you know, there's a weird story about splitting a baby? Yes. <laughs> so, that's that's a family law case. It, it really, in a classical sense, it is. Solomon, King Solomon, blah, 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 splitting the baby. That was, two people came in with a dispute, and this is how it used to work. You'd go into whoever your tribal leader, king, whatever was, you'd present your case, and you had a decision. That was court. And in that case, he said split the baby, and that was done, and he gave the baby to whatever happened. I, I was asleep, I'm sure, at that point. But whatever. Um, <laughs> so, no baby was ever harmed in that. That's all I remember. You know? I remember the first thing. Was, no, um, so, who's, who's had to deal with modern family law? I know one person, we're going to get to you in a second. But, who else has been in family law? Anybody had to deal with family law courts? Like, I was a guardian of litem for a while, which is basically you advocate for a child or a foster child. Yeah, guardian of litem, you know, we have specifically in Florida. My mother was sued by her father when she was two years old. Wow. That's crazy. There's a piece of land in Manhattan that had been divided by five generations of wills and so many pieces that they sued everybody to consolidate it. And you included the two year old. And distribute the money. But yeah. Brilliant. But it had all those wills attached to it, so it was a geological gold mine to find no, sure. it's Brilliant, yeah. There was a, a few years ago. There was a giant one, it was a British case where they had to go back to like sixteen something because of the way the land had been split up and it turned out it was like four hundred and something different like devices between the time where the person ended up with no heir. So they didn't leave a will in this British case. There was no will left, and it took them like 17 years, and it was a giant estate at that point, and they had to figure out where the pieces all went, because the intestate laws between when you died without a will were so crazy complex, and they had to go back through all the chains to figure out like everybody's third cousin like for 300 years or something ridiculous. But in modern family laws, it, so I know one person, anybody been through a divorce? That's family court. Anybody? Were they fun? No. No, no. Right. Right. Yeah, it was hilarious. Oh, you did your own. Yeah. You're a brave man. <laughs> yeah. No, how was it? Well, it's fantastic. It's a Is it great still going on? No, no, no. I'm divorced now, but right. I also deal with divorce in my cases, so oh, I, yeah. I am on the other side of that as well. Everybody knows Scott Holton, <laughs> right? <laughs> Scott is divorced and looking. He is, he is. There's anybody out there is looking. Yes, really. Amy's about to be happy. Seriously? Uh oh. Let's say it. Cat fight. Billy's asking. Hey, hey Scott, you're going to be getting into your summer body? No! <laughs> <laughs> Steve was waiting to get beaten. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, how long did it take? Three years. Three years, okay. Honestly, that's not bad. <laughs> it's a little long, but... Um, it depends on if you agree or not. If yeah. you never agree, then it goes on forever. A no-fault divorce, is everybody familiar with the no-fault concept of a divorce? You go into court, you say, okay... We're we retarded. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Everybody's retarded, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, if I say something you don't understand, just ask me, I'll explain it. It's not a problem. Basically, a no-fault divorce, essentially, both parties walk in and say, well, you know, we just want to get divorced, we don't care, we've already decided how everything's going to work, custody's not a problem, boom, the court says, okay, great, legally divorces you, that's what you need the court to do, and then you're out, you're done. That's the end of it. Contested divorces are where they turn into these giant, giant beasts of madness, where the system doesn't work. Family law, family law courts are honestly one of the most dysfunctional parts of the U.S. court system at this point. Foster care system is a mess. Termination of parental rights is when they're taking a child away from a family because the family can't keep track of or can't handle the children they have. So they terminate the parental rights so that another family can uh, care for the child, essentially. And in between that time, they're awarded the state. That's the foster care system in the middle. And it should be something that's relatively quick because you're dealing with children who need stability and they need things taken care of. But instead, it turns into a giant fight. And in Florida, for example, the rules, and I have a friend who's a family law attorney in Georgia, and she was telling me they're almost exactly the same up here. The rules are that if the biological parents want to make an attempt to get their child back, they can try as many times as they want. No matter how bad they are, how many times they've hurt the child or they've delayed it or whatever, they can pop back up after three years of being an alcoholic and say, oh, I want my child back. And the Georgia courts, and Florida courts, specifically in the context I know of, they'll go, oh, okay, great. And they'll give the child back to the alcoholic parents until they screw up again, and then it repeats the cycle on and on and on. Which seems odd to me, it doesn't seem that's how courts should be functioning, but, beside the point, 
Divorce. So you get into a divorce case, and we'll use this context because it's fun to pick on Scott. But, um, but this is how, so classic family law, you went to the person presiding over, you gave your case, you had a decision, done, society moved on, which was the whole point of law. If you ever read like classic uh, jurisprudence texts or anything along those lines, it's actually pretty interesting how religion and uh, law form together to make society. Like They were combined instances to create what you got as a functioning world. In the US, they separated them, obviously, which I'm perfectly fine with, for the constitutions. But um, we ended up with these, this separate system where the legal system is slowed down, so you aren't getting these resolutions in quick time. And that's really what we're going to talk about. So in a divorce case, you start off, you have pre-suit. That's the initial part of a lawsuit where you've got depositions, interrogatories, motions in limine. Motion in limine is where you there's evidence you don't want in. So. Oh, let's say you had a personal injury suit at some point, you don't want that brought into a court. Let's say you're going to a jury trial for divorce. You don't want that brought in. You file a motion in limine so the court beforehand says, okay, you can or can't bring this up. You're limiting or you're limiting or pre-approving evidence to be admitted to a trial. So you've got all these motions that you deal with. The motion practice is extremely long. And the problem is in the middle of all this, they have continuances. So if one of the attorneys or one of the parties or something can't make it because they've got a pre-approved vacation or something, they might extend it. But trial court dockets are extremely busy right now. There's so many court cases and the courts are underfunded. So you've got a slot, let's say it's April 1st, for a hearing. Now, it's got to be continued because the other side's attorney can't make it because their child's got a baseball game that day or something that they can't miss. So then they bump it to the next hearing calendar and it might be May, it might be June. You don't know. And it depends how long of a hearing spot you need. So if you need half an hour to argue a simple motion, that's fine. If you need two hours or a three hour hearing, you may be waiting two or three months to get a slot on the calendar. And that, that's just pre-suit part. You may have five or six hearings on a relatively not complex case. So you move on from your pre-suit. You finally actually get through pre-suit. Depositions are done and deposit. I mean, all this drags out. And this can be a year. How long did your pre-suit run? Forever. Six months. Six months. Six months. Yeah, it's, it, it was more of the decision making process prior to just getting it to that point, yeah. So you sort through all this, and you know, obviously, a lot of the cases people try to settle it. And there's negotiations, you know, the mediations to see if things can be resolved peacefully outside the courts. Blah 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 blah. And you get from that, you get to the trial, right? You go to trial, and most trials are relatively short. They are. Has anybody been to a trial? Anybody been an expert witness? <laughs> really, you haven't been an expert? Yeah. What are you doing? Sitting on my ass playing Call of Duty. Mainly, <laughs> <laughs> you could get paid. Honest. <laughs> well, there might be like some video game litigation you could pop in and be like, I'm violent awesome. because of this game. Uh, no. Uh, can you try? No, but um, so you go to a trial, right? Who, so who's, someone give me hands again. Who was in a trial? Not you, you go to too many. <laughs> you. How was it? What were you there? Were you a jury? Were you in the trial? Uh, expert witness. Or or expert witness. Uh, federal court. Oh, okay. And how long was the trial? Do you know? Six, you... six years for the first one. Yeah, just the deal probably Excellent. So it was a six-year-long yeah. ordeal. Wow. Good, good. So, honestly, the reason I'm giving this talk is because a lot of you run your own businesses. Most of you, I meet, and you'll end up in litigation at some point. The more money you make, the more times you get sued. That's just the general rule in life. Um, like my brother, he runs his own companies, and the more money he was making, the more he got sued, so the more I had to deal with. So I get more emails, the more emails from him. And uh, Carla just started a business here, and I hope you don't get sued time. But if you do, you'll know what's going on, at least. Um, so you go to the court, right? You go to court, you've got your witnesses, your expert witnesses, and these all get presented, they get bumped, they get moved, blah, blah, blah. Most trials, in all honesty, maximum are going to run three days. That is a long civil trial in general. But some, like med mal cases or large governmental cases, etc., um, I dealt with one case that lasted two years. The, the trial actually was an, a year long. People, the jury was sitting there for a year. How long did the OJ trial run? It was 18 months or something? Like insanely long criminal trials. Um, most of them aren't that long. Most criminal trials are done in three to five days. Um, but you go to trial, you get done with trial. In the middle of trial, attorneys are objecting and blah, 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 blah. And there's all these fights over the jury. And before the jury is even selected, there's what known as a dire or a voir dire. It depends on if you want to sound French or not. But uh, it, it means jury selection, but they like to use fancy words, right? Why should it take over a year? That just seems like a waste of time on everybody. That's why we're here. <laughs> Thank you for paying attention, Steve. <laughs> no, um, but um, so you've got, you've got jury selection, and this is funny. My, my wife is British, and in Britain, they don't have jury selection. You get 
or the 12 people in Britain, you get 12 random people and that's your jury. Like, that's it. They just put them on there. They can hate everybody. They can not speak English, whatever. You're <laughs> stuck with them. Um, now, there's actually some minor checks they do, which is actually very similar to what happens in federal court here. Federal court in the U.S., they say, you know, are you going to be fair? People go, yes, and that's the end of it. Um, state courts, at least in Florida, and I know other state courts are similar, they ask you, who's, on, who's been on a jury? Did anybody go through this process? Do they, they you know, jury selection and they say, hey, you know, can you follow the evidence? Do you agree? Does anybody have an opinion about this case? Does anybody know the attorney? Blah, 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 blah. Is it? In my area, both times I've been called for jury, the judge swore into the candidates with no option to opt out of the jury. Huh. You, had to, you, had to, you couldn't say, I don't agree to this? Yeah. It's awkward. <laughs> they just went on. See, that's a good appellate issue. I'm an appellate attorney, by the way, so I, that's good to know. It should be on the record, and we can use that in the trial and appeal. Yeah, definitely an appellate issue. Like, I kind of swear. But you're sworn again when you're actually put on the panel, so if you objected at that point, it'd be kind of funny. The attorneys would throw a fit, and then there'd be a hearing, and then your case would drag out longer. So. <laughs> um, that's true. It's exactly true. You'd have a hearing after that, and then you'd have an you hearing, and then it'd be a deposition and an interrogatory, and then it would actually go back to selecting a jury again, like, seven years later. But, so you go up and they ask you all these questions, like, do you agree, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, if you pop up and you're like, I'm racist, they're like, okay, you're off the jury. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what's known as a cause challenge, and that basically means that you can't do a fair job. You, you can't follow the law. And there's great questions attorneys will ask you if they don't like you. And I worked uh, I worked in a federal court for a while, and I asked one of the U.S. prosecutors, that, you know, what's, what's your criteria for, you know, who do you always try to get on or off the jury? What's your selection? He goes, I don't want anyone on my jury with facial hair. Like, that was that was his thing. He, he said people with facial hair, they're just, they don't work well for his cases. So, interesting. So, like, mustaches, big beards, he was like, that was it, you were done. Like, you were not getting on the jury. And the way, one of the tricks that attorneys will use when they find somebody who, you know, they'll ask them, like, I do a lot of tobacco litigation. The attorneys there, we deal with King Spalding, which is out of Atlanta, etc. But one of the things that always is funny is that the question, this is both sides, defense and plaintiff, I'm not playing favorites here, is if you find a jury that you don't want on your jury, they'll ask you, would you think that you, do you think if we were on a level playing field that we'd be a step down compared to the other side? And if you go, yes, yes I do, I think you're horrible people, that's it. They're going to cause challenge you and you are off that jury. Like that is the ultimate way to get out of a jury. Um, or just say I'm racist and done. <laughs> um, I own stock in your company. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, if you're Adrian, you can say, so I pulled all your router addresses. <laughs> I realize that you're a state prosecutor, but your wife has Pilates at two. You need to get moving. <laughs> Have you ever been on a jury pool? Before? No, you know, I got called for jury duty one time in my life, and I kid you not, it was actually scheduled for the day of my first law school final exam. And so I just I sent the judge a letter that said, I've got a law school exam. And they just dismissed. He's like, no problem. Like, uh, it's actually a valid excuse, thank God. But no, I, I, like, it's funny. Um, attorneys, it's, they try to get you off juries quite often. They don't want you on them. But every so often, prosecutors love attorneys on juries because we walk in and we're like, we know the rules, this is fine. Um, but no, I've never been called again, and I have no idea why. I'd love to sit through a jury and see what happens. All I've got is 12 angry men to go on. It's just not the same, I think. But, so you get to suit, you have your trial, it's done. You either have a bench trial, which is where the judge decides it, or you have a jury trial, which is where a jury decided. Now, the rules on that are, you take the judge if you've got really good facts. You take the jury if you got nothing. Like, and you're hoping for a jury. But yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're really old, like if your client's a really old woman, you pick the jury. Um, but that's how it works. It, like, Typically, you pick the jury. Criminal cases are almost always jury trials. You don't ever take the judge, blah, blah, blah. You can have a bench trial for a criminal? Yeah, well, you, you can pick. You jury select it. It's your choice. Right? You have a right to a jury. You can waive it. Um, civil cases, a lot of times you'll get bench trials when it's a contract dispute. And both sides are just like, you know, we all agree on all the facts. We just need someone to sort it out. And that goes back to that classical, here's all our crap. Just make a decision for us. But Jury trials, the jury comes back as soon as they deliberate, which is usually, you know, maximum is usually two, three weeks, but it's usually two, three hours, sometimes two, three minutes. They'll come back and say, oh yeah, they were injured, here's the money. You have your decision right away. If you do a bench trial, you have to wait for the judge to write a written opinion, and it takes a while, um, typically. So, did you have a... Yeah. 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 
Make a new immediate. I couldn't hear you, though. You have a trial by judge that can't feel. Trial by judge, as opposed to trial by jury, you cannot appeal. You cannot Well, there is. That's interesting. I mean, it's 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 constitutional. There's old case law that basically says you don't have a right to appeal as long as the original trial affords you due process. We're we'll actually go through the appellate process here in a second. But essentially. As long as you got your decision and there was no fundamental rights violated, that's the end of it. But most states, I mean, at least in Florida and most other states, provide two levels of appeals. You got your first appeal and then you got your Supreme Court appeal. And that's state Supreme Court, not federal U.S. Supreme Court. And it's modeled after the federal system, essentially, to hear that. And originally, they didn't used to have district courts. It used to just be straight up, which is funny. Um, but yeah, your state, like Florida, could abolish our state support and our Florida Supreme Court, and that would be perfectly fine. If they, if, yeah, if they modify the, if they modify the Florida Constitution, we could just have our trial courts and be done with it. That's your decision and it moves on. Which is one thing I, I'm pondering. I've always wondered whether I'm a appellate attorney, so I'd be out of work. But um, so from my standpoint, I just have to go back to tech, which might be a better thing. But it, you know, would it be better for society? Because essentially, what the way the courts work is, you've got your first round, your judge or your jury makes your decision, then the appellate court reviews it, decides whether there was some legal or legal error, essentially, based on the record, and then you may or may not be able to take it up to the Supreme Court at the next level, where another set of judges, and usually expand. So in Florida, it goes from one judge to three judges to seven judges, and then if you take it all over the U.S. Supreme Court, it'll go to nine, which you need a constitutional hook. But there's there's always these, there's all these articles discussing whether or not the actual appellate review does you any favors in that sense of hey, what changed, what happened. And essentially, you're supposed to be getting more people looking at it, so it's supposed to have a better chance of reviewing it. But it, gets, it can get very complex, which we're going to talk about in just a second. <coughs> so you go, to, you, go to suit, you go to post-trial. So after you've got your decision from the jury, the judge, whatever, you file post-trial motions. Motion for new trial, motion for <coughs> J-N-O-V. I don't know if that's what you guys use in Georgia. It's judgment not standing. The verdict is what it's called, uh, which basically means, yeah, the jury was wrong. You have to award it to me anyway. Um, blah, blah, blah. Then you fight, like, whether the jury hid something from you. Those are always post-trial things. Like, someone on the jury didn't disclose they had a previous suit, so mine should be thrown out, even though it was a family law case and had nothing to do with what the case was. So these get all thought out. And then when that's done, and there's a final judgment, there's a final judgment, someone finally says, this is what you get, you're done, then it goes to appeal. And it always goes to appeal. Uh, I don't know about Georgia where you can't appeal, but in Florida, everything is appealed. If you have a case and you have a final judgment, someone's going to appeal it. Divorce case even, they'll appeal it. Um, then you go through your first appeal, that takes a year to two years, and then it comes back and you go to your second appeal, and it takes another year or two years, and that's just how it works. If they remand it, then you do it all over again. Remand means they send it back to the trial court. Most of the time, they send it back for a full retrial. You go back, you do everything over again, spending another three, four years, whatever, and then you go back on your appellate cycle because there's a new final judgment which can now be appealed again. So that's that's how these cases ping pong back in Florida. And I'll go through one. In Florida, we have, I don't know if Georgia has this, Florida, we've got what's known as NICA, which is a Neurological Care Act, which essentially was a, this, our legislature passed an act that said it was to protect a, uh, Protect OBGYN doctors who were uh, helping, were giving, were during the delivery process if a child was injured. It's to protect those doctors because they're they're usually very damaging, highly you know, they're neurological brain damage issues, which result in lifelong problems. So it's a huge medical malpractice series. So they passed this law, which essentially Florida collects a tax. The doctors pay into this fund, and the fund is a no-fault fund. If you qualify for it, they pay you. They take care of all the medical bills for the child for the rest of its life. Um, there was a NICA hearing that we dealt with, and this was 14 years ago, a child was injured. It was an infant that has to be at birth, so it was literally a seven-second-old child injured during birth. The suit gets filed a couple years later. So a suit gets filed, one of the party raises a NICA defense. So two of the, there were three parties, I should say. Two parties settled out, one party raised a NICA defense. And when you raise a NICA defense in Florida, it goes to what's known as an ALJ, an Administrative Law Judge. So it gets sent to this ALJ for a 30-minute hearing goes to a 30-minute hearing, and the judge says, no, you don't qualify for NICA because they didn't provide notice. That was the ruling. And notice is a you know, legal term. Somebody has to give you notice. Like when you're served with a subpoena, you have to be on notice or something. And NICA has a notice requirement. They said, you didn't get notice, so you don't qualify for NICA. So that goes on appeal. That goes on appeal to the second DCA, which is the second district of Florida. Goes up. They resolve it. They kick it. That, when they release their decision, they say, no, 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 notice was okay. That gets appealed to the Florida Supreme Court. 
Florida Supreme Court says, no, no, that wasn't okay, kicks it back to the second district. The second district has used their second opinion, and this is years and years later. This whole case took 14 years off of one hearing, mind you. So it goes back to the second DCA. The second DCA issues a second opinion. That opinion is appealed again to the Florida Supreme Court. The Florida Supreme Court takes it again, kicks it back to the second DCA. <laughs> the second DCA issues their third appellate opinion after one 30-minute hearing. Now, mind you, this is literally... Parties showed up for a 30-minute hearing, and they went for 14 years of litigation afterwards. Goes back to the second BCA for a, uh, their third opinion. The opinion literally, to summarize it, says, we don't know what to do with this. We're just going to kick it down to the ALJ to deal with it. Literally, like, nothing. Just said, we don't know. We give up. Here you go. So it goes back to the ALJ, but before it got to the ALJ, they actually ended up settling, finally, 14 years later, which is insane. Like, that's... This child was a teenager by the time after the injury happened. I mean, infant to teenager. Insane. Insanely long. Um, anybody been in law? Uh, you did a six-year case or so. Anybody been in any litigation like that? No, is it? So who, who's in a lawsuit again? Who's actually been dragged through a lawsuit? I mean, obviously. Yeah, well, I've had both, yeah. But you, yeah, you've been through a lot of Well, I also was yeah, arrested. Yeah. Good one. Way to go, Scott. <laughs> no, is it? If you've ever been through a lawsuit, it's miserable, right? Yeah. Like, you're, it's horrible. It's, it's terrible litigation. And even, like, it's, it, it's not fun. Everybody thinks, yeah, I'm going to get them. I'm going to go get a lawsuit. And the first thing I always tell my clients or anybody, like my family, who's like, oh, I'm thinking about suing somebody. I just look at them like, litigation is hell. Like, understand this. It's miserable. Because you're sitting there, you're toiling over it. You're like, oh, I need to, I need to get this deposition done next week. I got this. And if you handle your own case, it's even more miserable. Honestly, what people pay attorneys for is to make your lives simpler. Like, we're the ones who have to deal with all the people yelling at us so you don't have to, which sounds odd, but that's our job. Um, so the NICA case. And then I do tobacco appeals for a living. I do plaintiff side tobacco appeals uh, in Florida. Where there's this weird, like, the way it worked out. So there was a case filed in 1994. This is 17 years later. It took 17 years to get one case through the U.S. Supreme Court. That's how long it took. Uh, it started in 1994. I actually went to trial in 1996 after a couple of appeals on the class certification. Blah, blah, blah. Goes to trial for a year long. Wait, how, you, you mentioned like the second appeal or third appeal. How many times can either a, a civil court or a criminal court or um, a finding by the primary court be appealed? Um, as many times as there's still issues to be resolved. I mean, there's no number. So, it so goes, like if they made two mistakes during the trial, you could have an appeal about, oh, well, this jury, this member who was on the jury, they answered untruthfully for a question. They should have been disqualified. And so that gets resolved, and then you go to well, the second procedural problem. Typically, you have to bring every issue that was brought up on the first appeal. But sometimes what courts will do, if you don't bring an issue up on your initial appeal, it's known as waiver or race judicata. You're, you're required by the claims. you got law of the case doctrine, which essentially means that whatever you didn't say was an error on that initial appeal is now not error forevermore. Like, oh. you, you've acquiesced. So that first appeal, you like bring, you bring all it all the up. Yeah, it's and the kitchen you sink everything defense. that went No, wrong. you do. Um, and especially in death appeals, like death cases in Florida are big things, and you literally just have a laundry list of everything that went wrong. Um, but what happens in that NICA case, for example, it went up to the court. The court issued an opinion on one. There were several issues raised, but it only issued an opinion on decision on one thing. So when it went up to the Florida Supreme Court, they said, no, that was wrong, but now go back and decide this other issue instead. Why can't they, like, do the smartest court say, okay, of the three things you raised, no to that, no to that, yes to that. And they will. Usually there's like a there's a clause in it that says we've addressed all of the issues and it's resolved. But sometimes we'll just say we didn't bother to look at this other one because we resolved it off the bat on this one. And they'll do that in the sense when there's two really complex or, you know, maybe ten really complex legal issues. And courts have limited or not the time. They have limited resources. So they'll say, well, you're going to lose on this first one, so we're not going to look at these other nine, even though... We're not going to rule on them on the merits, which means we didn't look at them and evaluate them, because if we did, it might take us two years to sort out the law. It's just a crazy mess. So we're going to say that you lost on this first one, move on. And if you appeal that and the higher court says, no, 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 that was wrong on that first issue, now it's sent back to the appellate court to say, well, look at the other nine okay. and, and re-look at that first one. So it gets, you can ping pong back and forth forever. Tobacco cases, they started in 1994, went to 1996, interlocutory in the middle to do class. Interlocutory appeal means a, an appeal in the middle of a case, so it's, it's not a final judgment. You're appealing right in the middle, which you have to have special procedural stuff, which we're not going to cover because it doesn't matter at all. Um, that, they reversed the class, so it goes to trial, then it goes up to appeal again after a year-long trial. So the same court that approved the class now comes back and says, no, never mind, we should have never certified that class, breaks up the class, that's appealed to the Florida Supreme Court. The Florida Supreme Court in 2007, mind you, it started in 1994, 
2007, they come back and say, no, this class has to be broken up, but you all can go back and fight these trials. So it went, they broke it up into 8,000 individual trials. So now there's 8,000 trials in Florida that are pumping their way through the courts. The most they ever tried in a single year was 64 of these trials. So something, the statistic is something like the last person will have their trial 172 years from now. So that's justice. You know, like we're, we're, we're quick, justice is swift. Uh, no, but it's, it's, it's interesting because, now the funny part is, is that you got to remember in the plaintiff and defense side is how things work. Defense side, you typically want to drag out a case as long as physically possible. Inflation rates make your judgment lower because your damages don't change unless it's a, a lasting medical malpractice problem. So if you like break my car, let's say you ran into my car and my car is worth $1,000, now, if you drag it out for 10 years, inflation rates should have almost covered that thousand dollars off what you're making anyway. So you just got away with not having to pay anything because now my car is not worth anything. Blah blah blah. So you, if you're on the defense side, you drag it out as long as possible. And in these tobacco cases, the reason you want to drag it out is what's known as a dead dead case. So originally, they passed wrongful death statutes years and years ago, and the reason they did it was the golden rule in tort litigation. And tort's like just like a tort, just like a tort. You're twisting something. Um, tort litigation, when I say tort, that means somebody getting hurt is all it means, you hear that on the news. But in tort litigation, the golden rule was always, and still is honestly, is never maim someone, just kill them. Like, <laughs> if you're going to plow into someone's car, don't make them quadriplegic, because that's a $30 million judgment. Because, and does anyone know why judgments are that large? Because you have to pay for their entire life. You have to pay for their medical world. bills for the rest of your life. In England, they're not that large, because medical's covered. Uh -huh. So you hear these things on the news and these massive judgments, and what they never qualify to say is that somebody was turned into a paraplegic at 19 years old, has a lifespan of 78 years, so you're paying for their medical care. All you ever hear is it's $30 million, it's a giant judgment, we need tort reform, which always makes me giggle. Um, but beside the point, it's always tort reform, it's not court reform, which is always odd, but beside that, so you get all the way through all this stuff, blah, 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 you get these big judgments, and I don't remember what I was talking about. Really? Kill what? Oh yeah, kill never, never maim. Because if you turn into quadriplegic, you're going to pay for the rest of your life. If you kill them, you get a wrongful death judgment. If you kill somebody who has no friends or family, and friends doesn't count actually, it's just family. It's it's a wife or siblings. If you kill somebody who has that, nobody's going to sue for them because it's the estate that needs to bring it, and the state's not going to waste time on finding the estate bringing a case for them. So if you hit like some homeless guy with no friends or family there's going to be no litigation. So the rule is, but if you, if you turn them into a quadriplegic, now you've got a PI attorney who's going to take the case, blah, blah, blah. Don't kill people, though. I mean, you should do this on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. But, but that was, that was, they were actually having, they were having problems where people, when they were first starting to drive, like before they had wrongful death statutes, people were driving their cars, and they hit someone, they'd be like, well, I better just back over them. Like, yeah, I mean, like, this is honestly, like, this was, this was the mentality, like, oh, no one's around. Okay, I'm out. Because there was no wrongful death statute, so you couldn't actually bring a claim for someone dying back in the day. Now they pass a wrongful death statute, but wrongful death statutes aren't perfect. If all of the family is dead, and in my tobacco cases that I deal with, a lot of the family is older. So, so wait, a, a wrongful death is basically the civil side of... Uh, like a murder or a homicide trial, or basically you're saying, yeah, well, yeah, somebody your killed. action caused the death of someone who is an immediately family member, you owe us monetary Exactly, like you killed my father, so let's say a child's pregnant, in, which they're a dependent, so the child says, you know, the father, a single father, and he's got one kid, the kid brings it on behalf of his, you know, he's saying, you killed my father, now I've lost the benefit of having a father, I've lost the income my father was providing to me, etc., that's a wrongful death. And there's all these claims, you can get lost consortium, which is, you know, loss of care, whatever, uh, wives have certain claims they can bring, it's all different depending, but there's loss of income, etc., etc., etc. So, the golden rule is never hit somebody who made a lot of money, and if you do, kill them. Like, it's, it's, uh, so, like, these are the PI rules, like, you know, these are, these are the funny things, honestly. Like, don't kill somebody. Everybody can agree. Yeah. No, um, but, if you're on the defense side, the whole point of that entire gibberish ramble, which my life always likes to pick up me for gibbering, but, um, no, um, the whole purpose of it is, that if you're on the defense side, typically you want to drag these out because if you're worried you're going to have to pay for something, take it forever. And the greatest example of it is the Exxon Valdez case. Does anybody remember the whole Exxon mess? Some of you are too young, I can tell. Like, who was born? Who wasn't alive in 1989? Zip, I know you were alive. See, see, do you know what the Exxon Valdez is? Do you know what oil is? Now we're going to turn it up. <laughs> wow. wow. Were, were you born Same for that thing, one? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. No, no. So how old are you? 22. God, was it that long ago? Yeah. 1989. I was like, 
Wow. <laughs> Damn it, I'm old. Okay. No, um, so 1989, it was an era. They still had crazy hair. Cindy Lauper was popular. Cool. <laughs> uh, do you know who Cindy Lauper is? Oh, oh my god! god. <laughs> That's, where's Skydog? Skydog! Someone needs to show the Goonies tonight, Dan. <laughs> have, have you seen the Goonies? Baby Dollar Bill! Baby Dollar Bill! I need to watch it, but I haven't watched it yet. Movie Twice! Movie Twice! Movie Twice! Have you seen Morgan? Yes, I've seen Morgan. Have you seen Hackers? Yeah. Alright, you can say that. And Hackers too. Oh, you saw Hackers too. That was terrible. Yeah. No, uh, so, we were talking about oil spills, not BP, Exxon. So Exxon Valdez was a big boat. It was driven by a drunk guy, and he drove it into Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a big map and a big boat, and I could show it to you. And that's, just in the case was, is here's the boat, and it's boom, and he's drunk, and he probably well, skied off. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. The big, the big white space, and this is the oil spill here, this black part. And, so, and that's essentially what happened. They had a drunk guy driving a big boat, and he was like, yeah, 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 I'm a captain, I'm drunk, boom, right into Alaska. Seals and penguins and shit were just like, hey! <laughs> Whatever, about the big fucking mess, or BP. Yes, Adrian. No, no, no. He was on the boat with the drunk captain. Birds. Like he, he kept them as pets. He was a bird. Like I saw happy feet. They had oil and shit. Whatever. Right. So there's some there's some oil spilly shit and people get sued. That's the whole point of this. There's a big oil spill. What happens is 1989. So it goes and dragged out litigation, right? Before it actually gets to trial, and I've got the dates here because it always confuses me. I think it actually went to trial in 2000 and something. It goes to a jury. The jury awards 300 million in compensatory damages. So that means compensatories are compensating you for damage. So Alaska lost some tree or something and they owed them money. But they awarded $5 billion in punitive damages, which is damn it, Exxon, you shouldn't hire drunks that you know are alcoholics to drive your big boats to oil in special wild lake areas. And he went to work in Concordia. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Later on, he worked. He helped build the uh, oil pipeline, the, the BP oil pipeline. What? What's Concordia? The cruise. The cruise. Oh yeah, yeah. She, my wife actually won't go on cruises now because, like, that was the news article like, that was sitting there. I was like, we should go on a cruise, and that's on the front page of the London Times. I was like, never mind. Fuck that drink. No, no, no. So. It goes up to the Ninth Circuit, they take one appeal, right? And the Ninth Circuit says, no, 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 if that's too much money, you need to do what's known as a remittiture, which means lower the amount of a jury verdict. So juries aren't the penultimate, judges can modify it if it's too much or too little. Uh, it's known as additures to add remittiture to remit to remove. Um, they say remit it, so the judge looks at it, it's a federal court, and federal judges are usually pretty tough, right? But the federal judges, if if they if a case is really bad, like a corporate defendant's bad, federal judges are tough on both sides. And he was like, I've looked at this and five billion was too much, so it's four billion. Four billion's a good number. <laughs> now mind you, five billion was one year of Exxon's profits at the time. That's how they came up with the number. Right? So they award five billion dollars, gets remitted to four billion. And then it involves, at this point, it goes into thirteen years of appeal, back and forth. And they appealed it and the judge is like, well never mind, now it's four point five billion at one point, from what I've heard, what I'm told. 13 years of litigation finally ends up at the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court says, no, no, no. Well, it goes to the ninth. The ninth says 2.5 billion is a good number. It's half a year's profits. And then the U.S. Supreme Court takes it and says, no, no, no. Now, this is in July or June 2008. So it started in 1989. It goes up in 2008. Was that 19 years? Is that my math? Yeah. <clears throat> Just about 19 years later, the U.S. Supreme Court says, no, no, no. 507 million. That's what they should have punitive damages. Now, the amount was equal to the amount of the compensatories. It was one to one. So they awarded 200, or they awarded just about 30 million, but there was some there was compensatory settlements done in between there. So the number they come up with is $507 million 20 years later. Now, mind you, in this time, in 2008, Exxon made $45 billion. So their profits went from $5 billion to $45 billion. So now at the point, it was nine. It was one ninth of their annual profits, so what their actual punitive damage award was 20 years before, or 20 years later. But what they actually awarded was less, just a little, little over 1% of their annual profits for that year. And the amount they made on interest off the money they'd made in those intervening 20 years was, was far more than enough to cover their damages. So the punitive damages, mind you, which are to, everybody know the root word of punitive, to punish. Yes. You alive when you invented that word? <laughs> <laughs> Our education systems are working, our children are smart now. No, um, but we, the punitive damages ended up being 1% of a profit on a record year versus, you know, an entire year's worth of profits. 
So do you think they care or that it would stop things like BP oil spills? They probably spent more on the lawsuit. Actually, I think they're. I think they estimated their litigation fees were 400 million, and they said that including the punitive damages in the 400 million, they made no difference whatsoever to Exxon. Bottom line, like they just didn't care, which kind of defeats the purpose of one swift justice. So people in Alaska, that magical white area here, got compensation 20 years later, which maybe the oil started moving out by then. I'm not sure, but. Maybe it's still there. I don't. I don't go there. It's covered in oil. For long, so, but, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take a big ship and drink a lot. I don't know. Sarah Palin would probably be happy if you covered all. Sarah Palin would not be happy if I came to Alaska. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? She'd probably shoot me from a helicopter. Right? No, I'm saying you're just going to oil. She'd take your paw. <laughs> no. Um, so everybody's heard this case, and we're gonna. I don't even know what. How much time do I have? Anybody know? Like oh, Alright, perfect. This is always the fun one. Now, this is the one that everybody loves. McDonald's. Who's heard? Were you alive for that? <laughs> Do you know what McDonald's is? That's the place where you get the Happy Meals. Do you eat Happy Meals at McDonald's? Yes. Yes. Okay, he knows what McDonald's is. We're doing well. Do you know who the Hamburglar is? Oh. oh! Somebody beat his ass. <laughs> no beating people. Get some fuck. No, no um, so McDonald's. Did you hear about the hot coffee spill? Yeah. Does anybody remember this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did everybody go, what the fuck? What happened? Like, I remember I did. Like, I was an attorney of this. So, yeah, well, this is this is the greatest. Yeah, like, all these hot coffee cases that came after it, blah, 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 blah. But what, all you heard on the news was this woman awarded $2.7 million for spilling hot coffee on herself. Now, what they never told you, and if you actually go and pull the facts on the case, it's actually interesting, and the way the litigation history is actually what I want to talk about in this. So, $2.7 billion. Do you guys know how they got to the $2.7 million number? This was a suggestion. Oh, yeah. I, sure. Whoa, is, he knows. Is the profit that McDonald's made from their coffee in one day? Well, it was two days. Two days. McDonald's was making $1.35 million in... I don't think it was actually, I think it was revenue. I don't know if it was profits. It may have just been what their sales were per day. I was never clear on that point. <laughs> but roughly it was two days worth of McDonald's coffee sales for the year is what they punished them with. Like, and the whole basis of the case was it was essentially a product, product liability case, which is known as strict liability. If your product's affected, you have to pay for it. Um, and they did that because there's a chain of custody on things. So somebody makes your kid's big wheel truck, right? Somebody made the the bike parts and somebody make the wheel and the handlebars, and let's say the wheel breaks out, you don't have to sue everybody in that chain, you sue the last person who sold it to you, who's Toys R Us, and Toys R Us is liable for everybody in that chain, so that's essentially where this law comes from, right? But could Toys R Us then sue the... They can sue for indemnification, they can bring them in as third party claimants and everybody can get sued, and then you get all these depositions, and 12 years later, you go on appeal. Um, <laughs> and that's when you hire me. But... Um, <coughs> So they go to trial, blah, 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 or before trial, this is what happens. They bring a product liability suit, and the facts behind the case is what they never cover in any of this. And this is why it's always funny, because it's the poster child for tort reform. And in some senses, it was an odd case. It was. They're suing over somebody spilling coffee. Now, usually how it's pitched is that she was driving the car, put it in her lap, and spilled it. Not what happened. She was a 79-year-old woman. She was sitting in the passenger seat with her, I believe it was her son or her daughter driving it. Someone was driving it. The coffee... What they sued on, and this is the ground that they were sued on, she was wearing sweatpants, so when the coffee spilled, it went into her sweatpants, and she ended up with third-degree burns on 6% of her body. Skin grafts, blah, 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 in the hospital for three days, blah, blah, blah. Medical bills were over just about under, just under $11,000. So what they sued on was that the coffee was too hot. So what had happened was is they went and pulled, they sued McDonald's, and they get all this, what's known as discovery. That's when you get all this evidence. And it turned out that there had been 700 reported incidents where McDonald's had burned people from their coffee temperatures. It was too hot. Um, which is showing prior knowledge. They knew there was a defect and they didn't move to fix it. And that's what they went to the jury with. And the jury said, well, yeah, this is a problem. Um, what happened was, is it goes up and they said, no, this is too much money. And in the state that where they sued, there was a, a cap on punitive damages. So they were, she was awarded 160000 She was awarded $200,000. That was her judgment. That was compensatory. So that's for damages for medical bills, etc. And her medical bills were roughly eleven thousand dollars. What they never tell you, she tried to settle for twenty thousand. She said, just pay my medical bills and I'll walk away. They said no, we'll take it to trial. And this is one of those weird areas of jurisdiction. Yeah. This is Yeah, well yeah, they're insured, it should have been 
fucking shot. <laughs> Most people would probably settle at this point, honestly. But they were like, no, we're going to take this to trial. And I'm guessing because there were 700 prior incidents, and, and that's common. Like tobacco litigation, you never settle. Tobacco companies never settle a case because they don't want other people suing. And that's common. If, you, if you've got a defect that you're worried is going to keep coming up, you sue the crap out of them, and you litigate the hell out of it, so other people won't do it. That's asbestos trying to do it. It's, it's common industry tactic. It's a defense thing. Right, um, so you're saying, like, if they had settled with that lady, then the 700 people would have been like, whoa, 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 whoa. The next time someone spoke coffee on themselves, they would have been like, well, now I'll bring a case. They were trying to dissuade it, but the problem is they ended up getting more people to do it because they, she got a big judgment. And she, we'll get to what happened at the end of it. But, so she gets sued, blah, 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 or she tries to settle for 20000 they say take it to court. And this is a big question in jurisprudence where people are always discussing within the area of law. Should there be all these protections for people who take things to court? Because you had a chance to settle. They had a chance. They could have done it for twenty thousand dollars. And said, "No, we want a jury to decide this." And a lot of times, when you take a case up to a jury, you're hoping for a random defense one. The defense verdict. You're just hoping the jury doesn't like this case or doesn't like the law or whatever, and just goes for your side. But if you lose, what's the point if there's a protection for you? So all these med mal caps. That's always the flip of it. So in Florida, you've got all these med mal caps, and I just dealt with a hospital. Uh, they injured a child, it was a preemie child, they gave her a hundred times the amount of medicine she was supposed to get. They gave her a dosage for a 168 pound male, she was a 1.6 pound baby. Um, they gave her this dosage and caused severe brain damage, and they fought it, and the reason they fought it is because they got med mal caps, and they also had sovereign immunity. So, the caps reduced it, it was a 19.2 million dollar verdict, and all this, most of it's her medical bills, right? So medical bills are pain and suffering, because the parents had already lost a child previously, and now they've got a second child that's severely brain damaged. So they brought this case pain and suffering, blah, blah, blah. They reduced, med mal caps reduced it from 19.2 to 6 something, because you can't reduce medical payments. Med mal caps, you can't reduce the defense story. But all that eventually got reduced to $200,000 to the sovereign immunity caps. So why not take it to trial? The most you had to risk was $200,000. So you might just win. Even if you spend a million dollars, what's the matter? because you're still coming out net of effect. So it, it's funny, bed mal caps are supposed to dissuade lawsuits, but they actually end up encouraging them because they don't encourage settlements. But it's odd, that's a whole another area we can talk about another time. So McDonald's takes it to court, they get a $2.7 million verdict based on the amount of sales per day, blah, blah, blah. So obviously six people or 12 people, I don't know what state it was in, sat down and decided this is what should be follow the law. They had a punitive damages statute, so she was awarded 200,000 compensatories, and there's what's known as comparative negligence, comparative fault. Has anyone done a PI case? Anybody been in a PI injury case? So if two people are at fault, let's say we're both driving cars and I'm playing on my phone and you're doing your hair and we run into each other. Now we both had some negligence, right? We were both being idiots on the road. Now who's responsible? Should it be all or nothing for one person versus the other? And that's how it used to be. It was known as contributory negligence. You were contributorily negligent. Even though the other person was 99% at fault, if you were 1% at fault, that's it, your case didn't get burned. Your case was dismissed, or nullified, essentially. Because you were supposed to be the perfect person, and the, the law changed in the U.S. and mentioned, so that's stupid, nobody's perfect, we're all screwing things up at some point. So they did what's known as comparative negligence. And in the McDonald's case, it's important, because what the jury said was, McDonald's, you were 80% at fault for having your coffee too hot. Old lady, you were 20% at fault for spilling it on yourself. And that's what happened. So they ordered $200,000, but it was reduced, to 80% of the value, to 160000 and then they said you get $2.7 million because McDonald's should have fixed this before, and we need to punish them. Now, the funny part is it worked, because now they got the things on the side of the thing that say, hot coffee, don't spill it on yourself. <laughs> so it kind of worked. But it's funny, uh, they actually, they never changed the temperature. I think they lowered it about 5 degrees. And what they pitched it to the trial was, is if this would have been 150 degrees instead of 180, or 160, 160 degrees instead of 180, the burns would have taken 20 seconds to get to her. So she could have removed the sweatpants before it burned her. But at 180 degrees, it would have taken two to, I think it was two to 12 seconds of the estimate. Now there's been some fight about whether the experts were wrong or not, and I don't know the law on it. I'm sure someone here could do the thermodynamics and work it out. But, um, so it comes back, blah, blah, blah. The court says, no, we need to reduce it to $640,000. And then, anybody guess what happens? It settled before it actually went on appeal. So <laughs> no one ever knows. I don't know. But some attorneys said it settled for less than 600 k So somewhere in there, it's settled. Um, so the golden rules, if you're on the defense side, what do you want to do? Okay. 
Kill someone. We don't kill anyone, we only give hugs. Uh, Back up. Kill and drag. I'm just saying, in ra random circumstances, you run into somebody and they're quadriplegic, you're better off to kill them. Like, statistically. They're not better off. <laughs> But um, if you've got men now capture sovereign immunity, you try your luck, why not? You know, might as well try to see if you can just get it dismissed. Um, curses, pain, nothing anyway. Um, don't yeah, yeah, don't ever hit anybody who's rich. It's a nightmare. Um, anybody have any questions? Anybody learn anything? I just want to clear this up. So if I hit somebody and they're paralyzed, they're saying I should go to my glove box, no. <laughs> that's, a, that's a murder charge. <laughs> that's not okay. But if you happen to be well, driving fast enough, on the civil side, you know you're going to at least like, completely destroy the light. You should speed up. No. <laughs> that's actual contributing. You're adding to the negligence there, so you're worse off. I'm just saying if fate happens and you know they're sitting there bleeding, you might just think to yourself, Man, I hope they're not paralyzed. And then that's a lot of blood. Keep and then bleeding. count the leaders and see where you're at. <laughs> you can work it out. It's a few dynamics problem. It's easy here. We can do it. You can just hold off on calling this one. No, no, no. You gotta if you call as quickly. You just dial slow. I'm not suggesting anyone do anything. Else. Bad idea. You will always get tried. <laughs> So he's asking about a cell phone line. I don't, I'm guessing it's Georgia law, right? Florida, you can be on the phone all you want when you're driving. It may be, and, and states can pass laws that zero tolerance. Does it make a presumption? Do you know? Yes. It does. Okay. It's still going to be, con it's still be comparative. Correct. Yeah. No, usually it's not, there's not like a priority. This, the legislature could have set one of the priority, they made it a contributory thing. There's no standard. But, but they didn't know. Okay, so it's going to end up the same. They're going to be able to pitch that you violated the law, it's not negligence per se. Um, yeah, it'll still go to the jury to figure out what percentage was. Is, you know, because your phone, the legislature could have said your phone automatically makes you liable for it, but apparently they didn't. I don't know the statute. It's just a ticket. So you'd be written a ticket for it, apparently. And then the jury would still have to decide whether your phone um, added to the fault or not. Because you could have just been on the phone, but they hit you on the backside, and it never would have made a difference anyway. Um, and that's for a jury. It's known as a question of fact. Juries decide questions of fact. Judges decide questions of law. Um, anybody else? Is it? I've asked this question to other lawyers that I know personally, and they're all a little bit left on the answer. Because we never have a straight person. answer. But that's because the law is never straight. A lawyer, but not my lawyer. Okay. I think it's perfectly fine, honestly. Um, I think it was part of the way the system was supposed to function. And I think that the Supreme Court decision said that you can't inform juries that they have a right to nullify is a problem because that was our check on the system. So you ended up with, so jury nullification, I got it, sorry, we'll, we'll qualify. Zip asked what my feelings on jury nullification was. Anybody know what it is? We're retarded. Okay. <laughs> Asses, we're being retarded. No, um, if, was it from a car accident? <laughs> no, um, so, no, uh, jury nullification is essentially a jury going against the law even though that's the law. Uh, so if they say, 0.08 DUI cases, it's, it's known as a jury verdict, right? DUI, legally you're over the limit is 0.08. But a jury may come back and say, to hell with this, by the grace of God go I. We all drive drunk in Georgia, Lowe, or Georgia roads, to hell with it, you're getting off today. Um, so they let you, they, they nullify the law, they, they make a decision based not on the law or the facts, but based on the jury system. And honestly, it was, it, it's, an, it's a right, it's a jury's right, and there's, there's an odd Supreme Court case that essentially says, the jury has a right to nullify a verdict, the judge can override that if he wants, so with a, with a JNOV, which is a judgment notwithstanding the verdict, which means even though the jury let you go, I'm going to find you guilty, and then it goes into a crazy appellate world, and you can usually win those fights, like the jury let me go, I'm fine. Um, but essentially the jury is saying, to hell with this crap, we're moving it back. And you're kind of seeing judge nullifications on these MPAA and RIA cases where they're like, yeah, you're supposed to get 2.3 million, but I'll give you 2.1EK, like where they're reducing the damages even though they're not supposed to. And that's essentially where a jury would come in and say, well, yeah, you violated these RIAA copyrights, but we don't give a shit because they're a bunch of bastards, so we're going to award nothing. And that's, that's a jury nullification. They're saying, essentially, this law doesn't comport with what we think is right for society. 
Um, but you're not allowed to tell the jury they have a right to go against the law anymore. They have to tell the jury they have to follow the law, which I think, I, I understand why the process is there, and I understand it in that sense, but I think it's weird. Uh, I honestly think juries should be informed they have a right to nullify laws if they disagree with them. But the reason they don't do it is because of the civil rights era when there were Jim Crow laws, and they were essentially the jury was just like, oh, we don't like that guy, boom, guilty. And yeah, but see, part of the problem is we have lobbyists, and lobbyists can get laws passed via money. Right. And so, therefore, it may not agree with the people. And the and people should have a right to stand up for what has been purchased. Well, I mean, the laws have ever evolving. And isn't that correct? <laughs> um, so I, I mean, honestly, you can just buy statutes. I, I had to work on a case one time where I figured out that there was a statute passed by the insurance industry that saved them roughly $300 million a year. That's what they estimated it would save them. And I think they paid in donations just under $50,000 to the senators and the congressmen that passed it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, they, they, were all, they were all above board donations. Never happened. They, they were all completely fine campaign contributions. But the funny part was, is that I pulled the, uh, so, you know, they have judicial hearings. They have these senatorial hearings, blah, 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 where they call you up congressional hearings, blah, blah, blah. So the way it worked is it was passed by the car insurance industry and rental car companies. That's what the law was protected. So the donations were made by Enterprise Rental Cars. All their executives donated the maximum amount. So it was like literally every VP was on the donation list from them, right? And then the people who testified at the congressional hearings were everyone who donated. So it was really funny. Like, they just pitched the law through, and then the Democratic side was like, hell with this law, this is terrible. And then every other state where the law was impacted, like Florida was one of the places where the, the government overrode our laws with this law. And um, they were all like, to hell with this, you're going to kill us. Because German, it, it was a law that basically said if you're driving a rental car, you're not liable for the people driving it. And it used to be in Florida, we have what's known as um, the dangerous instrumentality doctrine. If I lend you my car and you wreck into somebody, you're liable and I'm liable. And the way we keep, the reason they kept it in Florida is because we have a lot of tourists. We have a big tourist industry in Florida. So you get a German tourist coming in and Enterprise Rental Car says, would you like insurance? The guy says, no, I'm fine. Now he wrecks into somebody. He's German. He flies home. He's not paying for it. And this law essentially said enterprise isn't liable for it now. In my opinion, the proper way to handle that, which was fair to all sides, was mandatory insurance on rental cars if you can't prove you have proof of insurance, because then it's covered. And you just add to the cost of the rental car. It works out, but their costs went up so they couldn't be competitive, blah, blah, blah. So they passed the law that says they want to do it, so now a German guy hits from Florida and flies back to Germany here, just shit out of luck. Um, so don't live in Florida. Yeah, well, don't get hit by a German guy in Florida. <laughs> uh, which is funny, because my good friend's all German. Okay. Either side. So if you're in a civil case, one can request trial by jury goes to a jury at that point. Or if you both agree on a bench trial, it goes to a bench. What if you with the two sides not agree? Uh, then it goes to a jury. That's the de facto. Because I mean, just one has to opt for it. So if one side, I want a jury. That's it. It goes to the jury. But if both sides say we want a judge, it goes to the judge. Makes sense. Sorry. You have a right Exactly. You, the other side can't stop your rights with jury. So, the appeals process. Who does the appeal? Who brings the appeal? Uh, either side can, honestly. I'm sorry? I mean, usually it's the losing side and they're in the appellant. And the appellee is the, the side that's happy. Uh, they, they won the judgment. But, uh, so it depends on who won and who lost below. Um, but sometimes you'll have both sides bring an appeal, so there's an appeal and a cross appeal. Why would somebody who won a judgment then appeal it? You may not have won what you wanted, you may have won partially. So you won A and B, but you didn't see it, you really wanted C. And if it's going up on appeal, and you, like, so a lot of times it'll be done as a cross appeal. So you'll win A and B, but C's still sitting there. The other side really hates that you won A and B, so they bring it up on appeal challenging A and B, and you're already up on appeal because you've already been dragged into it, you might as well just appeal and say, well, you should, we should get C too anyway. So you do a cross appeal at that point. Who has the appeal argument? Uh, people like me. We do appellate arguments. Uh, so you hire an appellate attorney, essentially. You can, I mean, you can do them yourself. You can do pro se litigation, obviously. Um, you write your briefs, you do oral argument, and then it goes to the judge to make the decision. Or judges. Anybody else? All right, I'm out of time. Thank you very much.